I'm Pastor Jonathan Ember. I'm the lead and founding pastor for those maybe who are here that are new and even those who are watching online or at our North Campus. We just want to welcome them as well. Can we give them a big welcome and our guests a big welcome today? So one of the ways that I just share the word of God here at Diversity Church is we preach in sermon series. I feel like God gives me a theme and I feel like we need to explore that theme throughout the scriptures. And the theme that we're in right now is called spirit animals. And what we've been doing is we've been looking at nature like many people do to try to find themselves. We've been looking at nature to see our fallen nature. If you're born again, uh, you still live in this body, this thing that is called the flesh that is still plagued by the sinful nature that we receive through Adam and Eve. And how many of you guys know that we need to be born again, and we also need to be born again, again, and again, and again, right? We all still have lostness that is still inside of us, and we've been comparing that lostness to certain animal tendencies or animal instincts. And Jude uh, actually was the one who came up with this. I didn't share this alone. I didn't come up with this thing. Jude is literally calling out people in the church. In Jude 1.10, and he's saying like unthinking animals, they just do whatever their instincts tell them. How many times are we just relying on our own instincts, on just the way that we've always done something, maybe out of our emotions that we do something, but that might not be the way that God has called us to live. That might not be the thing that God has called us to do. We need to actually get more influence from the Spirit of God and the Word of God than just our instincts. Because if we don't do that, like he says, they bring about their own destruction. So we've been looking at different animals, comparing that to certain instincts that we have on the inside of us that needs to be born again. Today, we're going to do that by looking at the snake. The snake. Do I have anybody in the house or watching online that loves snakes? Okay, I got one person in here. It is not normally our favorite animal or animal of choice, right? Uh, snakes do not get like the top animal um, on your like desirable list, like of pets you want to have or things like that. It's just not normally the thing that we just like say, I want, I love. There's some people that are weird and they love snakes. Well, good for them. Uh, uh, they are a part of the creation of God. And so, um, yeah, good for you if you love a snake. But... One of the things that we do in this culture, just because we don't like snakes, is we actually call other people snakes. You guys already know this, right? Right? Don't we like use that as a derogatory word? We say that person is a snake. And when we're calling them a snake, well, what are we saying about them? They're a jerk, right? Or they're kind of shady. We do this with other animals too. You guys might not have realized this. We do this with other animals. Like if, if, um, if you call somebody a chicken, for example, what are you saying about that person? They're scared. They're a coward, right? We do this with other animals. If you call somebody a pig, well, we won't go into that, right? Um, we do this with other animals. People do it with snakes too. And I was actually on my Twitter uh, page in January and I was scrolling through and I saw that PETA was trying to come against this idea of calling people animals. PETA is like, you know, the organization that tries to protect animals and, and they kind of do it to maybe the nth degree. But this is what they were saying about doing what I was just saying we do about calling people snakes. This is what they said on their Twitter page. It says, calling someone an animal as an insult reinforces the myth that humans are superior to other animals. And they actually call this speciesism. And they say that this is a justice issue. And so no longer should we call somebody a chicken. No longer should we call somebody a snake. No longer, because if we do this, we are increasing, increasing speciesism. And what we're doing is we're, we're just promoting this myth that mankind is greater than animals. Can I tell PETA and can I tell anybody who believes that? That is nonsense, all right? We as the people of God are actually made in the image of God and especially if you are born again, you are recreated in the image of Christ. I don't care what PETA says. I don't care what somebody on Twitter says. Listen, if you're acting like an animal, we need to be called out for acting like an animal because God didn't call us to be an animal. He called us to be his children. Come on, somebody, right? <laughs> so with all that nonsense of speciesism, we see that Jesus actually calls out some people. And he, guess what he says in Matthew 23, verse 33? Uh, Peter probably wouldn't like this, but this is what Jesus said. Because again, God didn't make us to act like unthinking animals doing whatever our instincts tell us. Especially in the church, especially if you call in the name of the Lord. Look at what Matthew 23, 33 says. It says, you snakes. This is red letters in your Bible, by the way. This is Jesus speaking to the religious leaders of his time. Kind of like Jude was saying to the religious leaders and people in the church of his time. He, literally, you snakes, 
You brood of vipers. How will you escape being condemned to hell? Well, when we think about Jesus, we don't normally think about him like this, right? We think of him being this like pansy Jesus who's just kumbaya and he's all peace and he's all, you know, love. And he is those things too. But listen, when people are not acting out the way that he has recreated them or acting out the way that he created us in the beginning, I'm going to tell you something. He's going to call you out. He's going to say, stop it, repent, because you're acting like a snake. And guess what? That snake, that, that, that desire, that instinct of a snake is actually leading you to destruction. It's leading you to hell. All right? So I think we need to be aware of this, especially in the church, because we have no business acting like a snake. If we're on the way to heaven, which we are, if we've accepted Christ as our Lord and Savior, it's time for us to start acting like it. Let your instincts come from heaven, not just in this fallen nature that is down here on the earth, all right? So I want to just share with you, because I want to explore this, I want to even explore who Jesus was talking about in this portion of scripture by sharing with you three ways we can act like a snake, all right? Three ways we can act like a snake, because today, if we find ourselves in this spirit animal, we got to repent, And we need to say, Jesus, would you change us again? Or maybe if you're not born again in here and you've never accepted Christ, you're gonna say, Jesus, would you come into my life and would you save me? All right, here's the first way. First way we can act like a snake is by acting constrictive. By acting constrictive, all right? Look at what Jesus said. Again, he's giving this broad terminology first. As he's giving this analogy of saying uh, to them that they're acting like snakes, he first says, you snakes. And then he categorized another snake, called it a viper. But I want you just to think about, there's multiple categories of snakes. Maybe you guys didn't know this, but there are some snakes that kill their prey by injecting them with venom, right? You guys knew that. But not all snakes have venom. Some snakes are actually constrictors where they actually go and wrap around their prey and they suffocate their prey and they actually take the oxygen from their prey and that's how they kill them and then they swallow them and then they eat them. Some snakes like this, some of you guys are really mad that I'm talking about snakes this morning, but some snakes like this are actually boa constrictors and pythons and even rat snakes, all right? These are all types of constrictor snakes who again constrict their prey to death. They, they just wrap around them and they take their weight and they just squeeze them literally to death, all right? When Jesus is calling the religious leaders of his time snakes, I want you to think about how this applies to them, them being constrictive, them being constrictors, if you will. Matter of fact, if you read all of Matthew 23, it is talking about these religious leaders, Pharisees, scribes, um, and Sadducees, all of these religious leaders of Jesus's time in Judaism. And one of the things that he says about them earlier in that chapter, before he called them a snake, look what he says that they're doing to people. In Matthew 23, verse four, this is earlier in that chapter. Look at what he says that they do. They tie up heavy, cumbersome loads and put them on other people's shoulders. I want you to think about this is religion a lot of times. And guess what? It's your relationship with others a lot of times. The way that you're trying to maybe convince somebody to act, the way you're trying to get them to do what you want them to do. How many times are we actually putting more of a load, more rules, more regulations, more pressure on somebody to conform to the way we actually want them to conform, right? This is exactly what Judaism was doing at the time. Judaism already had 613 laws that that God literally said, this is what I have for the Jewish people. This is what I do not have for the Jewish people. 613 laws. But then the religious leaders that Jesus is talking to, he's saying, you're actually putting extra load on them that I actually never told them that they should or should not do. All right. And the reason why they were doing it, and this is the reason why this is a fruit of the flesh, is because out of our flesh, we're always looking at the letter of the law, not the spirit of the law. Out of of our flesh, we're always trying to almost get to a place where there's this class system. If I do more, I'm better than somebody else. If I do more, then I can actually, and if I put more on others, I can actually control them through this manipulation and through all of this extra stuff so that they will do exactly what I want them to do. It's just a work of the flesh. It's not a work of the spirit. It's not understanding the spirit of the law. It's not understanding the heart of the law. It's just forcing something on somebody 
And in this scenario, the Pharisees were forcing something that God never actually spoke. They did this through many different ways. One of the things that they would tell um, people is, of course, that you can't break the Sabbath day. That was a Ten Commandment, right? That was one of the Ten Commandments, the Fourth Commandment, keep the Sabbath day holy. But one of the things that the Pharisees would do is they like put extra rules on people that they actually would tell them that you have to actually only take a certain amount of steps on the Sabbath day. And if you actually take more than 2,000 steps on the Sabbath day, you're condemned. You're going to hell. A matter of fact, I'm going to kill you right here. All right? So the rule that you have to keep the Sabbath day holy wasn't enough for them. They had to take it further, and they actually spelled out you can only take 2,000 steps. All right, they did this with all sorts of rules and all sorts of regulation. They just piled it up on their people. And what Jesus is saying, you're putting this burden on them and you can't even carry this burden yourself. How often is this the case in religion and in the case in our relationships? How many times do we tell our partner, our our spouse, that you can't do this, but we go and we do that same thing? It's flesh. All right, how many times in church we got leaders that are saying, don't do this and don't look at this and don't act like this, but then you see them doing the same thing. You know why? Because the flesh profits nothing. It has no power to save somebody. Just having a rule and an extra rule has no power to convince somebody that that rule is good and worth following. If that was the case, then none of us would have sped here this morning because the speed limit said 40. If a rule was enough and more rules were enough, then people wouldn't be murdering people and people wouldn't have been doing all these other things that we see them doing. Rules aren't enough to create that desire inside to do good. But this is what the Pharisees and this is what many people even do in relationships. They they just suffocate somebody by putting more rules, more boundaries, more law, And listen, rules aren't bad. Boundaries aren't bad. Like, But if you think that that's the thing that's gonna control them to get them to do what you really want them to do, you're mistaken. (laughs) This is the thing that will convince somebody more than anything else, love. (laughs) This is what Jesus actually comes and introduces in the new covenant. This is what Jesus said. He says, here's the the two commandments. You wanna know commandments? I'm gonna take all those 613 commands and all of those other commands that all, of these preachers are preaching about that go beyond the 613. I'm going to just reduce it all to two. You want to know what you're to do in the kingdom of God? Love God and love other people. So what Jesus was doing was reducing everything in the purpose of every law and the purpose of every regulation and the purpose of every boundary. What he was doing, he says, it's all about love. Listen, and your relationship with others, and your relationship with God, if you're not motivated primarily by love, you're acting like a snake or you're being consumed by a snake. I I don't know if you got that. This is where a lot of people are even in bondage in churches and to church leaders, just like the Pharisees. When you're thinking that your relationship with God and your relationship with others is all about law, all about another burden, all about another command, all about all of these other things instead of loving God and loving other people. If that is not your heart, if that is not your motive, you have missed Christianity, and that's how we become more snake-like. Listen, I want you to understand this about uh, constricting and constrictiveness and, and just adding more and more of this type of weight in somebody's life. Constricting leads to death. If you don't believe this, what happened to George Floyd last, early last summer? He was constricted. He couldn't breathe anymore. How many of us are acting like that? How many of us feel that way in church? How many of us feel like that in our relationship with God? How many of us are actually doing that same thing to others? We're just putting more law, more burden, more more pressure to measure up, and you have to do this, and you have to do that, and you are feeling suffocated, and you're actually suffocating others. You could do this in parenting. You can do this in friendships. You can do this in dating relationships. 
How many times do I see somebody that I'm having to counsel in a relationship because all they're doing is putting more pressure and more pressure, more law, more law? How many times am I seeing that in marriage and marriages are being destroyed because all it is is about you measuring up and and I'm, I'm gonna put all this pressure on you. You better do this. You better act like this. And what does it do? It just causes suffocation. It causes that this is a work of the flesh. Y'all, you know what we really need to do? We need to say, God, I know I can't change this person. You know where my marriage really started getting good is when I realized I didn't have to pressure Nicole to be who I wanted her to be. I just needed to let God do the work that only God can really do in her life. And the more I prayed for her, the more I loved her, the more I saw her blossom and bloom into the woman of God that he created her to be. And she could say the same thing about me. My job is not to change you. Come on, somebody. My job is not to control you. My job is just to lead you to Jesus, lead you to the spirit of God where he's the only one, where his yoke is easy. Come on, somebody. And his burden is light. And he's able to do in you in a moment more than I could ever do in my own strength, my own flesh, and my own power. This is grace, y'all. This is the breath of life. This is the spirit of the law. This is the reason why there's any regulation at all. It's all about love. It's all about knowing that God supremely loves us. And he wants us to do that same thing. And he wants us to supremely love other people. If you're in a relationship with this, like this, if you're in a church like this, if you're around people like this that are so constricting, if you're in a marriage, you got to stay there according to the Lord pray. But if you're not, maybe you're just dating somebody, maybe you're around friends like this, guess what you need to do? Run. Run. I I remember when I was in Florida and, um, you know, there's all sorts of bugs and animals like crocodiles, all that kind of stuff in Florida. And I remember I was going to check my mail one day and um, my mailbox was kind of on the end of the street in our apartment complex. And I was uh, checking the mail and I go to turn the corner to check on my mail. And all of a sudden I see this big rat snake. I mean, this thing was probably in a coil this big. And this thing was at least that round. And he was coiled up with his head up. And I was like, oh! And I turned the other way and I said, not today. Come on, somebody. I ran the other direction, right? That was a constrictor. That was a snake. And I wanted nothing to do with it. Can I tell somebody you want nothing to do with this type of religion that is so constrictive? You want nothing to do with that type of person who's trying to control your every move. You want nothing to do with that type of person who is telling you what type of makeup you can wear, how much you can wear, what type of dress you can wear, how low it could be. You don't want nothing to do with somebody that is literally trying to control every move you make. That's dead religion. That's flesh. You want somebody that's going to love you supremely and unconditionally. And out of that love, out of that love, you feel like, okay, I don't want to disappoint. I don't want to hurt. And you start living out of a, a love relationship with God. A desire for God because he first desired you, right? Now, let me ask you this. Are you being like that constrictor? Are you being like that snake? Are you being like that in your marriage relationship? Are you being like that? I remember I was like this really a lot in my first two years of following Jesus. I felt like I had to constrict people to Jesus. I felt like if my brothers or my sister, whoever weren't following Jesus, I got to put a little bit more law on them. I'd be like, Jake the snake. You know what I mean? Any wrestling fans? You know, I just got to constrict them to Jesus. You know what I mean? You guys ever felt that way? It's law. It's me being in the flesh thinking that I could really constrict somebody to Jesus. Listen, if I constrict somebody to Jesus, you know who they're really going to be following me. But if I point people to Jesus, because everything else, including me, can be like a snake sometime, and you don't want that constricting. You want the freedom that comes wherever the spirit of the Lord is. There is freedom. If I point them to him, guess what? The Holy Spirit can number one, cause them to be born again. And once they're born again and they have that new nature, then he can start teaching them about love and grace and mercy and peace and kindness and goodness and all those other things that are found in him. Obviously, the Pharisees did not have this. They were just used to putting on more burdens because all they were trying to do was control people. 
manipulate people, use people, ultimately suffocate them. All right, so again, one of the ways that we can be like a snake is through being constrictive. Here's the second way that we can act like a snake is by acting greedy and self-indulgent. By acting greedy and self-indulgent. All right, listen, just like every other animal, snakes like to eat. Did y'all know that? There was a story coming from Florida. Again, I was telling you about this rat snake. There was a story coming from Florida in 2018 that, that, that told this, this uh, story about a snake that weighed 32 pounds. 32 pounds, right? Huge snake. It was a python who actually ate a white-tailed deer weighing 35 pounds. He ate a meal that weighed more than him. He weighs 33 pounds, and he swallows a white-tailed deer that weighed 35 pounds. How many guys know that snakes are self-indulgent and greedy? Come on, somebody, right? Matter of fact, if you look at the animal kingdom and you want to see a picture of the flesh, all you need to do is look at how animals eat. I mean, that's just, that's how they are. Uh, it, it is very clear that if you want to see a picture of your sinful nature and you want to see a picture of how your sinful nature can be, all you need to do is look at how an animal eats. This is again why Jesus is calling the Pharisees snakes. I want you to look at Matthew 23, 25 with me. Matthew 23, 25, again, that same portion of scripture in Matthew 23, he says, woe to you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. Again, this is the nice Jesus that we all see on TV and movies and stuff. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. Look at this. You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Greed and self-indulgence. And then later on in that chapter is where he said, you guys are snakes. You guys are snakes. If you look at this, I want you to think about what he's saying. If you look at any animal, look at your dogs, right? You give them a treat, and what do they do? If you try to take that treat back, they ain't having it, right? They're going to bite your hand off, right? right? If you look at any animal, you, you see them. Maybe it's the hyenas that, that just found some prey, and they're eating on that. I mean, they're just going to town. They don't care about anybody around them, right? They don't care about uh, anything except for just getting theirs. They're greedy and self-indulgent. We were watching, actually... Um, a, a documentary about animals the other day, and it was highlighting gorillas. And we were looking at the gorillas, and this gorilla was in a, um, you know, a, a refuge for animals. It was actually in Disney Animal Kingdom, and these, uh, this one gorilla was actually celebrating its like 35th birthday, okay? And so the, the zookeepers of this refuge ended up giving this gorilla a sweet potato cake for its birthday. I was like, I didn't know there was such a thing as sweet potato cake, but I probably don't want that because that is not the self-indulgence that I go after. I go after a blizzard, ice cream, you know, some, uh, you know, some candy in that blizzard, ice cream, some Butterfinger in that blizzard, ice cream, some type of Reese cup in that blizzard, ice cream, right? That's what I go for if I'm being self-indulgent, right? They're going for a sweet potato cake. But anyway, all right, the gorilla is seeing this before him. And he's out there by himself, and he's like just going to town at this on the sweet potato cake, all right? But all of a sudden, his other family members, and he's the top dog, but all of his other family members start to smell the sweet potato cake. And so guess what they do? They come for it, right? This is this gorilla's birthday, and they have the audacity to come after his sweet potato cake? Greed. Self-indulgence, it got the best of them. Their instincts came alive, and they, one of them tried to snatch the sweet potato cake. Number one, the gorilla, whose birthday it was, wanted nothing to do with sharing his cake. Now you guys are seeing yourself right now in this gorilla. He wanted nothing to do with sharing this cake, right? But once his family members are coming around, he's like swiping them away. He's giving them a big old gorilla back slap to the face. Like one of them came and he tried to snatch it. The gorilla said, not today. He grabbed his cake back. And I mean, they were just having this moment of greed and self-indulgence. Don't act like we never get there in our life. 
Don't ever act like we don't have that instinct that we don't wanna share. Don't act like you'd ever have that instinct, like you gotta be the first in line to make sure everything is that you really want is there at that buffet or at that potluck or whatever. Come on, somebody, we got this greed and self-indulgence inside of us. Don't act like when it's offering time that, that in the church and, and we're calling for an offering, like you're not like squeezing your pocket a little bit more because you're not really wanting to come off that cash. Don't act like you don't have this greed and self-indulgent nature that rises up in you. Because this is all a part of all of our flesh. This is a part of all of our fallen natures. We are like this so often. And how often is this the case in religion? So I was just talking about offering that way. But how often is it that maybe the priests or the pastors are wanting the offering really for themselves so that they are greedy and self-indulgent because they just want to consume all of that for their own needs, their own desires, their own ones. How often is this the case in relationships? I want you to think about how this is an animalistic tendency. This is an animalistic way. It comes from our flesh. We're just, we're just hungry for ours. We're coming to get ours. And we don't literally care about how that affects anybody else. As I was reading this portion of scripture, it reminded me of a story in the Old Testament about um, Eli's sons. Eli's sons were named Phineas and Hophni. It's one of the most provocative stories in all of the scripture because these two dudes were scoundrels, all right? They oversaw the priestly duties in the temple of the Old Testament, and one of the things that was uh, right for the priest to do was to get some of theirs, right? So when people would come and they would offer their sacrifice, they would come and offer animals before. They just didn't give money in the Old Testament. They gave animals, they gave grain, they gave all these other things, right? So they come to the temple and they're given these things and it was okay for the priest uh, when those meats were being boiled and things like that to take a fork and dip that fork in the boiling pot and grab some meat for them and their family, all right? That was customary and it was good, all right? These two jokers, Phineas and Hophni, and by the way, Phineas means a serpent's mouth. That's the name of this son. I don't know why his dad was calling him serpent mouth. Not a good way to prophesy over your child, okay? Serpent mouth, his brother, Hophni, literally meant tadpole. So I don't know what was going on there. Obviously, his parents had no care to name them after animals and doing animalistic things. And that's literally what they ended up doing. So they were not just doing what was customary and taking out from that fork out of the boiling um, you know, water, the different meats that was customary for them to do. What they actually commanded was anybody, if they were gonna have their offering met and accepted in the temple, what they would do is they said, you have to give us the best cut of meat and don't you dare boil it. What they were doing is they were being greedy and self-indulgent, all right? They said, we want the best meat, and if your offering's gonna be sacrificed, and they tied this thing to God. How many times are we actually tying something to God? God told me to marry you. <laughs> but God really didn't say nothing to do that. That is just your own instincts. That's just your own selfish desire. That's just that self-indulgent, greedy thing. You saw something that you liked and you wanted it, and then you put God on it. Don't act like we don't do that in our Christianity. We put God on something. We say that God said something when really it's just our own heart our own instincts that want that thing. I remember in Bible college, every dude had every girl on their list that God told them that that was their person that they were supposed to marry. I'm like, God really didn't tell you that. You just liked her butt. You know what I'm saying? Like, come on, man. Just your instincts. You know what I'm saying, right? Like, God, you, you question that. Like, did God really say? My wife's looking at me twisted, right? Don't act like that ain't an instinct. Don't act like that is a desire. And this is kind of what these priests were doing too. You know what they were also doing in the temple? Having sex with prostitutes. They had no self-control. That's a fruit of the spirit. They had none of that in their hearts. They were just about, they were like this snake, just trying to consume everything that they could get their hands on. Just trying to consume everything that came that they wanted 
That is an animalistic tendency. That is a fruit of the flesh. That is not a fruit of the spirit. That is not what God would have for us. And so God literally said, okay, this is the way you're gonna act in my temple. You're cut off. They were judged and they were killed literally by God for their detestable, scoundrel, snake-like behavior. Now, this is not appropriate in the kingdom of God. Acting like this is not the way that God would have us act. They were just like this snake mouth. It's so interesting. His name was Phineas, which meant serpent mouth. Do you guys know this about the anatomy of a snake? Do you know that the jaw is not connected to the skull? This is the reason why a snake can consume. Even though their head looks like this, it can open up and consume a deer, right? The reason why is because their jaw is not connected to their skull. How many times in our life is our jaw not connected to our skull? I want you to hear this, church. How many times is the thing that we're wanting to, to consume and that thing that we're wanting to, to, again, consume upon our own lust, our own self-indulgence, our own greediness? How many times, even though our mind and, and the spirit of God in our mind, because we have the mind of Christ, is telling us no, Maybe it's offering. Let's go back to that because this happens a lot of times even in our offering, right? Maybe when we're giving to the Lord, maybe it's in our tithes, right? I don't know about you, but every single time I see that tithe check going to Diversity Church and the Indiana District Assemblies of God and I see that money, my jaw is like, I want to close on that. I don't want to give this away. Anybody else feel what I'm talking about, Right? You guys know what I'm talking about? I could use that for me. I could buy a new car. That, that's a more than a car payment. You know what I'm saying? And then I just think about my own greed and my own self-indulgence and what I could do with this money, right? How many times do you, do you see this again with maybe other people? We could go back to the horse message, the stallion message, because you see something and you want to consume that, but your jaw is not connected to your head. Something else might not be connected to your head. You're greedy. You're self-indulgent. You're just going after things to consume them. This is exactly what these religious leaders were doing of Jesus' time. So we called them out. He says, you guys are snakes. You're full of greed and self-indulgence. And here's the last way that we can act like snakes. The last way is we can actually act devious. We can act devious. Look at Matthew 23, 33. He goes on and he says, you snakes. And then he calls them, you brood of vipers. All right, so now he's differentiating the snakes, okay? It's not just a constrictor now that he's talking about. He's actually now saying, you're actually like a viper. Now, I want you to know this about a viper. This is maybe something, again, that you didn't know, that they're actually, uh, they camouflage themselves and they're um, normally the coloration and the design on their back. It's actually so that they can blend into their surroundings, and vipers, more than any other snake, have this coloration that would help them blend into their surroundings. There are even some vipers that actually, with their tail, those little, you know, you've seen like a, like a rattlesnake, that tail that like kind of rattles and stuff. What some of these vipers will do is they'll actually disguise their tail as a prey, like a worm or something else. So like when birds come and they're thinking that they're about to get a worm, it's actually the snake's tail. And so when they feel the bite, they then bite and inject them with venom and then swallow the bird. They're devious. They're devious. They hide. They blend in with their surroundings until it's time for them to strike. Tell me that this is not like religious leaders and sometimes even us. Look at what Jesus goes on and he says, or before he actually called him a snake in Matthew 23, 27, he says, woe to you teachers of the law and Pharisees. Look what he says, you hypocrites. By the way, he says this over and over and over and over again in this chapter. He just called him hypocrite after hypocrite. Man, what if I just, my whole message, every point was you're a hypocrite. Three points of my message, hypocrite, hypocrite, and hypocrite. <laughs> It's essentially what he was doing all throughout Matthew 23. He's like, you are a hypocrite. You're a hypocrite and you're a hypocrite. We already read one verse. He did it over and over again. But what that word hypocrite actually means is an actor. Somebody with a mask on. Somebody disguising themselves. He says, you hypocrites, you're like whitewashed tombs. 
Think about this. You go to the graveyard. You were like a whitewashed tomb, a gorgeous, beautiful tomb that is arrayed in white and colorful and nice and clean and all that, which looks beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of bones of the dead and everything unclean. He said, you guys are putting on a disguise. You look good. You look like church people. You look like you belong to me in your big robes and your beautiful, you know, hymns of your garment and headdresses and all of these other things. You look like a priest. You look like you belong to the kingdom. You look like you're holy and you have it all together. But really on the inside of you, you are full of dead men's bones and every unclean thing. Meaning these Pharisees, these leaders in the church, when you stripped away all of what looked holy and all that looked good, when you stripped away their collar, come on somebody, when you stripped away their title, when you stripped away the things that made them look like they were godly and religious, really in their heart of hearts, they were wicked, deceivers, deceitful, stalking prey, looking to strike, looking just to consume people upon their lust? How many times is this church? And we, we can say that and we can look at a pastor, right? And we could rail a pastor who falls into sin and we could actually say they should have never done that, right? But how many times are we putting on the same act? People don't know what I'm doing behind closed doors. Oh, you'll look at the pastor, you'll judge him for falling. And I think we should because the scripture actually says they're held to even a higher standard and a teacher will be judged more harshly. But why don't we look inward too? You know, when I see a pastor fall, guess what I'm not doing? I'm not just sitting there railing against him. I'm looking inward to say, okay, what is in me that is still animalistic that needs to be crucified? Listen, when we see things like this that happens and we actually see pastors fall, we even look at, this is Jesus who's able to judge rightly, right? And justly because he was perfect. He did not have any guile or, or, or any dead men's bones inside of him. He, he wasn't putting on a front. He was transparent. He was the son of God in flesh and he was letting God shine through him. So he was able to judge this scenario rightly and call them out rightly, but guess what? This is the reason why he tells us before we're going to judge somebody else, let's remove the log from our own eye before we actually try to remove the speck from somebody else's eye. Guess who he was talking to? These same Pharisees. Who were all about deceit and all about deviousness and all of these other things. They, they really weren't true to themselves. They weren't true to God. They weren't true to others. They were hypocrites. They were actors. How often is this the case in your Christianity? Come into church and you put your church clothes on. You go around others, you put your mask on. You're just wearing a disguise. You're used to disguising yourself. Y'all, in the kingdom of God, though this might be an instinct from our forefathers, our forefather and mother, Adam and Eve, Remember what happened when they sinned? What did they do? They begin to cover themselves. That's our instinct many times is to cover up, not, our, not let our true motive shine, not let our true desires shine, not let out those true desires and true motives. No, no, no. We have to actually blend in so that no one actually sees what our true desire and our true motive is. This is our instinct. Just like anything else that I've talked about in this series, this comes from our flesh, that desire to hide. In the kingdom of God, the Bible actually calls us children of light in whom there is no darkness. We have been actually translated from the kingdom of darkness, the Bible says, and we've been brought into the kingdom of God's dear son, Jesus, who says, I am the light of the world. Y'all, if we're trying to hide in any darkness inside, I want you to know where that comes from. It comes from your fallen nature. It comes from the flesh, all right? It comes from that place in you, just like this snake that's trying to hide. And this can take on so many different forms. But one of the reasons why we do this 
is because we don't actually want our desires to be known. I want you to think about this. Transparency, if, if we're going to be transparent or people can just see us like we are, the reason why snakes are not transparent, the reason why they blend in, the reason why they're devious is because they know if they shine who they really are, they're a predator and people and other animals are going to try to kill them right away. So this is the reason why transparency is risky, right? But it's a risk we're supposed to take in the kingdom of God because we're supposed to crucify that desire to hide in the kingdom of God because we are children of light. This is even why I share with you very open and transparent about the struggles that I still go through, the struggles that I still feel, the times where I still even feel like a snake and the times where I even want to control my wife's Starbucks habit. God, you'll deal with it one day. Lord, help us. <laughs> the reason why I do that, right, is that's that flesh, right? The reason why I open up to you is to crucify that flesh, to crucify that tendency. The reason why I have accountability and even our, our staff actually has just initiated something where we're going to actually be accountable with our uh, phone and our internet usage and things like that with each other. The reason why we do that is so that we can crucify the flesh, that we can be transparent, that we can literally say, you know what? I'm not gonna be a snake in the kingdom of God. I am open, I'm without shame because Jesus hung on a cross to bear my shame. And so I'm gonna open up about my desires. I'm gonna open up about my shame. I'm gonna open up about those things that I still struggle with because it's dealt with in the kingdom of God. If we have a motive and a desire inside of our heart, we need to share those things. Sometimes those motives and desires might be rejected by God or other people, right? And the reason why we then go incognito and then we try to control and we try to manipulate or whatever, we try to strike like a snake is because again, we don't want them to say no to us. They might say no to you. God might actually say no to you, but let that desire out. Others might say no to you, but let that desire out because there's nothing to hide in the kingdom of God. If you've been taught to hide, I want you to know where that tendency comes from. It's your fallen nature. It's like this snake. I wanna finish the sermon with this story. I was sent to a trade show to sell movie rights for this ministry that I was a part of in Brazil. And um, it was this trade show was actually in Colorado. And I was a young man and I was uh, just kind of, wanted to go and do exactly what the ministry leaders told me to do. I was trying to sell this movie right. And so I'm going to some guys who actually own certain movie label companies. And um, I'm, I'm actually going to them. I'm saying, hey, I'm so-and-so from this ministry in Brazil, and uh, we're wanting you to buy the, these movie rights, right? And so I'm talking to this guy, and he looks at me, and he's like, I've never seen somebody so honest. Now, I want you to understand something. This is a Christian trade show. But the way that Christians sometimes do business, the way that Christians sometimes do church, the way that Christians sometimes do relationships are more like a snake hiding our motives, hiding our desires, hiding what we really want, hiding our flaws, hiding all that. We're going back to Adam and Eve in the garden, putting fig leaves on. Why? Because that's a part of our fallen nature. You, child of God, you're not supposed to rely on that nature anymore. The nature of somebody who's born again is a nature of truth, a nature of purity, a nature of transparency. There is nothing to hide. And as I'm talking about this, and as I've been talking about throughout this whole series, different desires, different tendencies, different instincts that you've had. I want you just to think about this, like Matthew 23, 33, at the end of it says, it says, you're a snake, a brood of vipers. And it says, how will you escape being condemned to hell? If as I've been talking today, or I've, I've been talking throughout the whole series, and you feel like you're actually consumed by all of these desires, 
that there really isn't a fight or a desire inside of you that's greater than some of these desires, maybe you've never been born again. How can you escape the fires of hell? And that really was a metaphor because the farmers would catch a field on fire to clear it and ready it for the next crop. And guess what the snakes would do? They would try to scurry out, but the fire would even catch the snakes and burn the snakes up. Sometimes that's the case for somebody. And the only way you're gonna escape the fire of hell, the only way you're gonna escape those tendencies and those instincts is being born again. If you're in this place, you're watching online and you've never been born again, you've never said, Christ, I repent and I ask you to come to my life and be my Lord and Savior. If you've never done that, there's no way you're gonna escape the fire of hell or escape these instincts on the inside. And for all of us who do know Christ, it's not a matter maybe of going to hell, but I want you to know that God doesn't want any destruction in your life or hell in your life today. So he's saying, repent. Thanks for joining us for worship today. I'm John Collier, and I hope today has inspired you to love God and to love others more. We always wanna take some time at the end to pray for you, especially if this is the first time of believing that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. Let's pray. Father, forgive us of our sins. Thank you for sending your son to die on the cross and raise again so that he can be king and we don't have to be. Help us to learn more about you so we can live more like you. <laughs> we want you to connect with us and we want to connect with you. You can comment down below or go to diversitychurch.net and we'll see you again next week.